Hey, this is Jorgen Rasmussen. Welcome to the Provocative Hypnosis Vlog. There is no such thing as an unconscious mind. There is no such thing as a conscious mind either. In actuality, there really is no, no mind to be found anywhere. I mean, I challenge you. Try to find a mind. It's unfindable. What you could talk about, though, is a process of minding. If there was such a thing as a mind, it, it would be a collection of thoughts. But since there is no thinker of thoughts, with thought itself being the thinker, you know, there really is no such thing as a mind. So even though we in the hypnosis world very often talk about, you know, idiomotor signaling, parts work, uh, communicating with the unconscious mind, there really is no such thing as an unconscious mind. There really is no, no entity that we can call the unconscious mind. Now, one reason why I bring this up is because I see, I've seen quite a few alarming uh, trends in the hypnosis and hypnotherapy and NLP world of a lot of people conceptualizing that there is such a thing as an unconscious mind that's kind of lurking around that is all knowing and, and wise and has the answers to everything. And if only you can get the so-called conscious mind out of the way and access a deep hypnotic state, you can get the truth and the answers from an unconscious mind. In some cases, this almost takes on a evangelical religious zeal, as in people who may not be religious at all in, in the traditional sense, this idea of an entity-like unconscious mind that can give them the answers. Um, some, sometimes turns into a secular form of, of absolutistic, uh, sloppy thinking. So, well, there is no such thing as an unconscious mind. There certainly are unconscious processes. Uh, we humans have access to non-rational ways of knowing, of, of forms of wisdom, of, of intuitions that, that we can access. So I am largely, you know, stop doing stuff like idiomotor signaling, you know, to so-called speak to the unconscious, parts work, uh, regression work, uh, uh, this type of stuff. And I would urge you to be very careful about doing so yourself. And I'd like to share with you why I think there are better options at play. Essentially, what I'm trying to do is, is not to tell you the truth with a capital T, because I won't claim to know it, or even that it is necessarily discoverable. But I would like to provide you with what I think is a more updated map. So here's a few key points I, I would like for you to consider. And that is, in the words of Daniel Wegner, uh, hypnosis is a nightmare science. It is a thing, well, it's not a thing really, it's a process, but it's, it's a thing that very easily turns into whatever you suggest that it is. So it's a bit like, you know, well, what if this thing has wheels and now suddenly it has wheels? You know, what if it's green and fluffy and suddenly it is green and fluffy? So one problem in terms of science and hypnosis is if you're dealing with a thing that has a tendency to turn into whatever you think that it is, um, it's, it's very clear that if you have some sort of theory or some sort of hypothesis about what hypnotized subjects are supposed to do, and you're able to create a good context, you're able to create a hypnotic contract, and you have people who are responsive, uh, then you will very likely be able to get these people to, you know, have experiences and behave in ways 
that support exactly the theory that you set out to prove or discover to begin with. So when I started doing hypnosis, I, I had a pretty naive view, which was that through hypnosis, you could discover truths. You, you, you could discover, uh, you know, perhaps what really happened or how you really feel or what your real motives are. And over time, I have come to discover more and more that hypnosis is way more about creating than it is about discovering. Meaning, a lot of the stuff that people claim to discover as insights, as how they really feel, as what really happened, what, what motives they actually have, uh, these things are less discoveries of some truth waiting to be found and more likely a co-created outcome in an act interaction between the hypnotist and the subject and the contextual relationship factors at play. So I'll give you a couple of fun examples of this. Uh, one of my favorites is an example that John Grinder uh, often used to talk about, and it revolves around the, the famous family therapist, Virginia Satir, who would work with a family, and you had this husband and father who, uh, who was very angry and very frustrated, and, and Virginia paced his anger and frustration beautifully by saying, you know, you're frustrated and you do all these things and you take on responsibilities and you work hard and you're angry because you don't get appreciated and so on and so forth. And, you know, the father, you know, nods along because this beautifully paces his, his reality. And then Virginia looks at him with expectancy and says, now that you've expressed the anger and frustration that you feel, would you be willing to talk about the deep feelings of hurt behind that anger? And the father spontaneously bursts out crying, you know, with tears and sobbing to the extreme surprise of the other family members and the father himself, perhaps even including Virginia, or perhaps not Virginia. Uh, I don't know. Now, here, here's my question to you, and that is, did this guy really discover the hurt basis of his anger, the hurt beneath the anger? Well, maybe. I mean, I, I, I can't claim with certainty that it's not that way. But... Uh, as John Grinder used to say, you know, if, if you really believe that this is proof that, you know, he had feelings of hurt beneath the anger, then anyone who acts out the role of a, you know, chicken, you know, or, or something else in a stage hypnosis show must have had repressed impulses of, of acting like a chicken that, that just got discovered. So um, I'll, I'll give another fun example of this. Uh, Ernest Hilgard, who, who was you know, a very known hypnosis researcher in, in the last century, had this neo-dissociation theory about hypnosis. And he had this idea that, that you know, the, the, the psyche could kind of be compartmentalized into two parts. So you might have a part that was hypnotized and a part that was not hypnotized. So he would do these cold presser tests, you know, for pain control. And he would suggest analgesia. And people would report no pain or or you know, in some cases, very little pain compared to when they did the same thing and were not hypnotized. And then Hilgard would, would ask quite innocently if perhaps, you know, he would set up these finger signals and, and he would ask these innocent questions about whether perhaps there was a part of the mind that, that you know, a, a hidden observer that kind of was not hypnotized and, and observing what was going on and uh, he, he would get yes responses, and, and he would ask if, if perhaps that part of the mind felt a lot more pain 
than the hypnotized part of the mind. And, and he discovered, discovered this to be the case, that while people consciously reported very little or no pain, there was this hidden, this hidden observer who actually knew about and felt a lot more of the pain. And, 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 and this was a theory that a lot of people, uh, you know, believed in. You know, this, this was serious science. Uh, now, Nicholas Spanos uh, and someone else, I can't remember his name at the moment, um, kind of suspected that this hidden observer might be a suggested effect, not a discovered effect, but a suggested effect, a fabrication, like a lot of what's, you know, uh, happening in, in hypnosis. So they, they did the same thing. They, they hypnotized people and people would report uh, no pain or, or little pain, or in sometimes, you know, some cases, you know, some pain. Um, while doing these cold pressure uh, tests. But then Spanos and his colleague would, would suggest that there might be a, a hidden observer there of some sorts that, that wasn't hypnotized. And, and again, innocently ask if, if it could be the case that that hidden observer felt even less pain than the you know, hypnotized subject. And, and lo and behold, you know, now they discovered that people had these uh, hidden observers that actually felt less pain than the so-called hypnotized part of the person's psyche. So this is this kind of suggests that these hidden observers may be more the result of suggestion and something created in that particular context than it is some truth, some factor lying there, you know, waiting to be discovered. And uh, you can, you know, I've, I've, I made a long video about this before, so I'm, I'm not going to go heavily into it. But I mean, the, the idea that there is a unconscious mind in there, like an entity that can give you the, the truth and nothing but the truth is a suggested effect. Meaning if you, if you suggest to people who have the capacity to respond that there is such a thing and that such a thing can be communicated with to give answers, then lo and behold, a lot of people will have the experience of there being you know, these answers coming from the unconscious mind uh, telling them the truth. Now, if if you look back at the uh, repressed memory craze, you know, the, the memory wars of the 80s and 90s, you, you, you know that a, a horrible, a horrific amount of people, way more than almost anyone believes who hasn't looked into the topic, discovered in quotation marks sexual abuse in therapy which in, in all likelihood never happened these discoveries are people who who came to therapy not knowing that they had been abused or not having any memories of it and then allegedly discovering sexual abuse during the therapy process now these cases are in all likelihood or these so-called discoveries are in all likelihood fabrications based upon the current modern memory research. Memory does not seem to work that way. But again, contextual factors. If, if you have a person who experiences a lot of suffering, and they're vulnerable, you know, they're, they're looking for reasons, they're looking to discover why. And if you then, as a therapist, use your authority, uh, your perceived authority to tell the person that, look, these symptoms that you have are very often indicative or almost certainly indicative of having been abused. You know, can you remember having been abused? Now, even if the person says no, if they accept the premise, 
if, if they accept the premise that there is such a thing as repressed memories, that the mind has just split off these memories because they were too painful to be dealt with, that they're there to be discovered, and that the only way you can, you know, heal or, or have peace of mind is, is for these memories to be rediscovered and processed and dealt with. If the client accepts that premise and then enters into a therapeutic therapeutic relationship where they're invited to, to draw and to trust their intuition and they spend time with other, you know, survivors and, and they get reinforced, you know, and, and rewarded every time they they so-called get a memory and and they may be invited to just trust their intuition or, or to, to do drawing or to do uh, imagination exercises. They, they may even, unfortunately, in, in some of these cases, do hypnosis where they then get suggested that, that there is this unconscious mind that's all-knowing and that really knows the truth that can reveal the answer. And they might ask, was I abused? And, and they might have a non-voluntary yes response followed by images and emotions, you know, either then and there or over time. And these may be experienced in some cases as real as real. And since it feels so real, this this then has been used as evidence that people have discovered uh, you know abuse that they must have repressed there, there's something else too here that's that's uh, you know often overlooked and, th and that is that the motives that you have when you do the search will, will very much influence what you're what you will be likely to find so so um, as an example with the abuse, um, if, if you have a person who, who has a lot of suffering and perhaps has a, a mindset that they should have accomplished more or they should have been happier or they're a bit entitled or narcissistic perhaps, you know, their, their, their mind is now kind of in a, a, a conflict because on, on the one hand, they're this very smart capable person and on the other hand who deserves to be happy and on the other hand uh, they have a lot of suffering you know this repressed memory thing then for example becomes a very attractive thing because you're off the hook you know you you if you can discover that hey look the the reason why my life isn't that good or i've made poor decisions or or you know has nothing to do with me but it it, it has to do with you know the trauma that i was sub subjected to you know as a kid so they 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 get to keep their you know identity and they get to outsource the blame so to speak so it's it's a very very attractive very very attractive theory and um, I remember when I first started doing hypnotic work, I, I uh, trained with a guy called Tad James, and, and we did timeline therapy, which is something I no longer do either. Um, also, because I no longer buy into the idea of cause and effect, you know, in living systems. But uh, during the timeline therapy process, you would have the script where you would say, you know, what's the root cause, assuming that there is such a thing, but what's the root cause of this, you know, symptom, you know, uh, which when we release will cause this, you know, migraine or whatever to disappear. If you were to know, would it be before, during, or after your birth? And then the person would answer, and if it was before, you would get, well, was it past lives or was it genealogical? And Tad would use the, the uh, argument that this was not leading in any way. You, you, you just innocently asked the questions and you just opened up for that person's model of the world. But I'll tell you this, just even implying it, just even putting it on the table as an option resulted in me getting these you know, it's a past life, uh, it was in my mother's womb type of responses quite regularly. And after I stopped, I mean, I kept doing 
regression work, you know, for a decade after this. But but after I stopped using the script, I never once got that response again. So it, it was very clear that that this was not in actuality about um, opening for the client's model of the world. These responses were highly dependent upon me introducing it as an option to begin with. So there's 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 another factor here as well that I, I I'm going to invite you to 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 take a look at and that is the power of context the power of context you know I used to teach reality based self defense for about 16 years and we used to do something called panic attacks where we would give people these plexiglass helmets and and uh, you know light protected gear and uh, you know people would instead of just sparring you know we would do actual self defense training we would do you know negotiation postures sucker punches two on one attacks weapon attacks uh, we would create scenarios where perhaps two people were supposed to mug a third person, you know, sitting in a chair, and they would play out these scenarios with dialogue and, and all sorts of stuff. Now, while this is clearly fake, people had a tendency to respond as if it was real. So I had, and I got this from a guy called Tony Blauer, just to give credit where credit is due. But I, I did this for many, many years, you know, these types of simulations. And I, I, I had so many black belts, you know, and, and trained people from various martial arts come into my school and do these panic attacks. And way more often than not, you, you couldn't really see any difference between the black belt in a martial art and a raw beginner. Um, for most people, older skills, you know, vanished. You'd see sloppy haymakers and shitty tackles and people freezing and people just going ballistic and you know one big reason for this is because pretty much older training had been done in a cooperative environment of relative calm with very little fear and an opponent that often wasn't really resisting you know, so you can get really good at various martial arts techniques in a state of relative calm in, in a context of cooperation, and it might look really, really good. But if you then suddenly are surprised and you might get, you know, strong fear or problems breathing or, you know, adrenaline surges or, or lose your, your, your gross motor uh, capacities, there may not be a bridge between the skills that you acquired in the dojo and the state of mind that you're suddenly in when you're attacked. So one kind of obvious solution to this is if you're serious about self-defense training, you have to do simulations that are as realistic as possible and you have to get into a state of mind that is likely as close to the adrenaline surge that you will be in likely in a real encounter if if you can practice operating from that place there's a far better chance that your skills will be available in that place now another reason why i'm using this as an example is that the black belts and the experts before they did these tasks were very confident that their skills would flourish during these panic attack exercises and this was almost always not the case so it shows that we can be very poor at predicting how we will respond in a context and in a state of mind that is very different from the one that we're currently in. I'll, I'll repeat this because I think it's a key insight. We are often very poor at predicting how we will respond in a state of mind and in a context that is very different from the one that we're currently in. So consider this issue with idiomotor 
signaling with hypnosis. Let's say that you do what we could call deep hypnosis and someone is in a profoundly deep or relaxed state where they're very focused and and they're they're displaying these hypnotic phenomena and you you may be you know asking the unconscious to communicate something and you you might even make a deal with the so-called unconscious mind that the next time they're in the dentist chair or they meet their mother-in-law or you know whatever it might be they're going to respond in a very very different way and you might get a lot of certainty around that change happening but i remember when i started out i would do these unconscious parts negotiations and sometimes the results would be great but what I often discovered was that these responses often had no predictive value whatsoever. Like you, you could have these this supposed unconscious mind making all sorts of deals left and right. The, the signals could seem very involuntary and so on and so forth. But um, it seemed like the unconscious mind was often very poor at predicting how the person would actually respond in a very different context and in a very different state of mind. Remember this, the answers, the insights are evoked in a very calm state of mind in a context defined as hypnosis. How much overlap, how much transfer, how much predictive power or self-insight does a person have to be able to predict their responses if they're in a very different state of mind or in a very, very different context. So th this is also something to appreciate and to be aware of. I'm going to give you one other example that I, that, that I think is very humorous and, and simultaneously quite scary. It comes from this book called Predictably Irrational by Dan Ariely. And there, there, there's a chapter there called How Hot is Hot? The, the Influence of arousal sexual arousal it sounds so formal when you use such a word so just we'll just call it horny or turned on but but anyways what dan Ariely and this colleague did was that they would look to find out to what extent people could predict how they would what they would want to do in a very different state of mind so they would interview these college students and ask them questions such as you know uh, you know, w would you take a date to a fancy restaurant to increase your chance of having sex with her? You know, would you tell a woman that you loved her to increase the chance uh, that she would have sex with you? Would you encourage your date to drink to increase the chance that she would have sex with you? Would you keep trying to have sex after your date says no? Would you slip a woman a drug to increase the chance that she would have sex with you? You know, these types of... Um, could you imagine getting sexually excited by contact with an animal? It's just kissing frustrating. Uh, you know, birth control is a woman's responsibility. Uh, you know, that type of stuff. And guys, you know, just guys who are selected for this, would be asked these questions in a state of calm. And they would also be asked to, you know, they would be asked to predict how they would respond, you know, if they were really turned on. And then later, they were, you know, in isolation, obviously, uh, put into this room where they had the chance to, to jerk off to, to porn. And, and they had this thing on the computer, which was projected. They were instructed not to come, not to ejaculate, but the computer was protected, you know, in, in, in case they did. Uh, not from being pregnant, obviously, but but they, they had this meter they could use to like uh, show their level of being turned on. And once they were in a really turned on state, they were asked to report the questions again. And the discrepancies, I mean, the, the gap between the answers that people gave while not turned on and while turned on were often scary high and, and their capacity to predict their own responses when they were not turned on was very much not impressive. So if we look at a couple of these statistics, you know, 
for example, would you keep trying to have sex after your date says no? Non-aroused, you have uh, a 20. You know, aroused, you have 45. You know, the difference in percentage is 125. W would you slip a, a drug to increase the chance that she would have sex with you? You know, 5% in the non-aroused state, 26 in the aroused state. Difference percentage, 420. Um, so, is, is just kissing frustrated, frustrating, non-aroused, 41, aroused, 69, difference percentage, 68. Can you imagine getting sexually excited by contact with an animal? Non-aroused, 6, aroused, 16, difference percent, percentage, 167. Can you imagine being attracted to a 12-year-old girl? Non-aroused 23, aroused 46, difference percentage 100. Uh, can you imagine having sex with a man? Non-aroused 8, aroused 14, difference percentage 75. I mean, this is this is quite staggering when when you think about it and offer some explanations as to how responses in the office in a particular context in a particular state may not always be that predictive for how people respond in a very different mind state in a very different context so so keep that in mind so what i like to do i mean one implication for me uh, from this type of stuff is that when I do sessions with people, I want I want to activate their symptom states. I, I want to activate the state that they're in while they're having their so-called problem. And I want to make sure that the the shifts in perspectives and the insights occur in those mind-body states during the sessions. Of course, very often they might be listening as if they're listening to music and quite tranced out and they have deep insights and that completely changes them in all sorts of contexts. That's also true. But, but for me, this also implies that I want to excite their stuff, so to speak. I, I, I want to evoke their symptom states and I want to make sure that they have the insights and have the shifts while they are in that state. This is, this is a key point. Um, also, instead of using idiomotor signaling, you know, finger signals or stuff like that, a kind of dissociated you know, signal presupposed, presupposing contact with this all-knowing powerful entity, um, I, I view this as training wheel exercises to learn to calibrate. So what I prefer to do is to use the state in and of itself as the calibration device. So if I say something or, or, or I suggest something or I, you know, do something and I see an increase in their state, that's a hotspot. If, if I see a decrease in their state or a relaxation, that's also a sign. So when I work with people and I, I very, my work is very much insight based for them to realize that thought is the source of their experience. That's pretty much what I'm always pointing them towards and, and that there is a piece, you know, underneath the noise, so to speak. So I... I want to calibrate their nonverbal responses as we go in real time. That's what I'm looking to do. So th this is my preferred, and I prefer not talking about parts or the unconscious mind or, or even imposing these things. And at least in my experience, you don't have to take my word for this, but at least in my experience, this has made the work more effective easier and it, and it evokes much different uh, responses. Now, never say never. I do my best to not come at things from a absolutist perspective. So, I mean, if, 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 if someone has, for example, facial twitching 
you could use the facial twitching as a yes no communication signal with the unconscious so to speak so i may you know let, let's say someone's crying and let's say that you were to ask you know what are you feeling and the person says i don't know no, you could say, well, if those eyes could speak, you know, what would they say? And, and now suddenly you get you get something because by by kind of dissociating or not being held responsible for the communication, that can free up responses for quite a few people. Um, if sometimes if you're looking to create changes that are way outside of the map of the person you're working with, you may strategically suggest an unconscious mind that has the exact capacities that they don't think they have and establish communication with it and help a person develop in that way. I mentioned this story earlier, but one of my most miraculous cases ever was a partial remission of a brain cancer with a guy who had virtually no short-term short memory so he couldn't carry on a conversation at all and this should have been a completely impossible case and it proved to be he died in the end but we got some dramatic shifts and, and there were some dramatic reductions in the tumor for a while and i met him at the door his daughter or not his daughter his wife came with him and, and uh for those for those of you who have my book provocative hypnosis you, you can read the details of the case there but i met him with a handshake induction and uh, i set up finger signals with the unconscious mind and negotiated a deal and the stuff that we negotiated actually happened in real time for a while and then his wife chose to not have him come back and it regenerated and he died of course this can also be a big fat coincidence you know and i'm not going to claim but in case it was, it was a really interesting big fat coincidence. But I, I have had people who have made dramatic changes by kind of imposing and suggesting that there is such a thing as an unconscious mind. So, so in, in cases where the resources or what you're setting out to do seems to be beyond their capacities or beyond their map, and even something that might be socially unacceptable as a result, uh, presupposing the existence of such an unconscious mind and setting up a deal may be the way to do it. But but in that case, you 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 do it as a uh, as a strategic choice. Uh, you may even suggest a unconscious mind that has the exact capacities that that the person seems to be lacking. So, but while there is no such thing as an, as an unconscious mind, there, there clearly are unconscious processes and we have access to wisdom. We, we, we do have some deep intuition. So if you do set up idiomotor signaling and, and you do that type of stuff, um, I think one smart thing to do is, is to not delude yourself into thinking that it is the truth from some pure... Um, source or as some spiritual for example three principles folks would say you know it's it's a download from from god or from the universe or the loving energy behind all life suddenly speaks when the personal thinking quiets down i think this is uh well, i think it's bullshit you know to, to to be frank um to to sell those those notions um may it be useful maybe um but don't view it as the truth view it as another source of information because what is clear is that sometimes you can get information that you perhaps would not get otherwise and view it as another source of information not the truth with a capital t and there, there, there there's also an element here of perhaps us often being able to know stuff that we don't know that we know. So uh, there, there's some research, for example, showing that strippers, uh, when they have their ovulation, get two to three times as much tips from the male guys than they would do otherwise. Now, th there are several plausible explanations for this, you know, 
uh, of course, the, the, the females themselves may not consciously know that they're ovulating, and then the males certainly don't know, but it could be that the hormonal changes are kind of inspiring these women to behave in more flirtatious ways, and that's why they get more tip. But, but it could also be that, you know, as a result of pheromones or other things, that the guys may unconsciously know that the women are ovulating without knowing that they know it and, and that there's a kind of unconscious communication in that. Or it may be BS. I, I don't really know. Anyways, I, I hope this somewhat lengthy episode of me ranting uh, at least evoked some thinking in you, got, got you to, to reconsider some stuff. You know, if you have any comments around it, you know, feel free to, to share it or, or to share the video wherever you found it. So until next time, happy exploring.